I think that it was the one that had me, you know, we should really reach out to her because this is some incredible writing. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to hear you talk today and to present about to the, the Texas protests. Yeah, that was the one about the Texas. I mean, I've read a few of your articles, but that one, um, I actually read it again and something because something came up um, like on my newsfeed and, and I was like, I'm going to go and read that again. Uh, it's it's just really well written. I was telling um, Lindsay earlier too. it looks like we're streaming on Facebook, so we can, I guess, talk later. Uh, looks like some people are still streaming in. Um, but I'll just go ahead and get us all started here. I'm going to move this screen over here so I can see. And uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, what's normally our legislative roundup. But thankfully, the uh, 2022 legislative session is over, um, not without uh, massively discriminatory bills making its way through and to the governor's desk and you know, we've we've talked about this, but today I'm delighted because we actually have a very special guest uh, and uh, we had to edit down her biography because I, I, I was like, this is going to take 10 minutes. It's so impressive. Uh, so today we're going to be speaking with Catherine Joyce. Uh, Catherine is an investigative reporter at Salon and the author of two books, The Child Catchers, Rescue Trafficking and the New Gospel of Adoption and, excuse me, Quiverful, Inside the Christian Patriarchy Movement. Formerly a contributing editor at the New Republic, her work has also appeared in Mother Jones, Vanity Fair, New York Times Magazine, Wired, Fox, The Nation, Cosmopolitan, The Atlantic, Newsweek, Religious Dispatches, and many, many others. She is formerly the editor of Political Research Associates Quarterly Magazine, The Public Eye, and teaches as an adjunct lecturer in Brooklyn's colleges, I'm sorry, Brooklyn College's Political Science Department. Um, so welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm pretty sure uh, that you're going to have Lindsay uh, working on the slides for you. So whenever you need to, just let Lindsay know and she will share her screen. That's great. Yeah, um, hopefully, Lindsay, that that came through. Um, and hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and thank you so much for taking an interest. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of my recent reporting in Salon concerning growing overlaps between different groups of right, right wing, particularly far right activists, some of whom are working to blend right wing versions of Christianity with far right activism against LGBTQ or reproductive rights um, in some cases, uh, in other cases on behalf of white nationalism or white supremacy. Some of these people have described themselves jokingly or not as Christian fascists. Um, so this is, if, if this name gets used, this is not me calling names. This is uh, a name that they have applied to themselves. Um, obviously most people involved do not use those terms. Uh, a number of them are white Christian nationalists who have been welcomed to join forces with far-right religious groups, um, such as the far-right Catholic media outlet, Church Militant, which has increasingly been making a lot of connections um, with, you know, outright kind of far-right white nationalist actors. Um, I want to start with a story that I co-authored in early June with Ben Lorber, um, who is my former colleague when I worked as the editor at the right-wing watchdog nonprofit Political Research Associates, um, where I was the editor for many years before joining Salon. Um, I've done a lot of reporting over the last two decades on the religious right. Um, most of that has been on the evangelical right, but in the last three or four years, I've been paying a lot of attention to the Catholic right as well. Um, whereas Ben is, um, you know, might well be the leading researcher in the country on far right movement known as the Grapers or America First, uh, which is basically this movement that arose out of the ashes of the alt-right after Charlottesville, the, the terrible deadly um, white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. Um, when that sort of sputtered out um, because of the backlash against that extremism, uh, the America First and Graper movement rose in its stead. Um, and it's, it's distinct from what the alt-right was um, in particular, because it's blending extreme white nationalism with appeals to traditionalist forms of Christianity, um, whereas the alt-right did not really do that so much. Um, so because these two factions are increasingly teaming up, 
Um, and Ben Lorber and I have, uh, you know, our kind of respective expertise on, on one side or the other of them. We've ended up teaming up a few times in the last uh, few months to, to look into a few different stories. Um, so the first one that I wanna talk about, um, we did in early June after there was an ugly incident in Dallas, Texas. Um, I don't know, Lindsay, is the, is the PowerPoint working? Yes, let me share here. Excellent, okay. Um, oops, let me just minimize that. Um, okay, so on June 4th, uh, a, a Dallas LGBTQ bar, it was called Mr. Mr., hosted a family-friendly drag queen brunch to celebrate Pride Month. Um, they advertised this with the pretty tongue-in-cheek slogan, drag your kids to pride. Um, the event was supposed to be a kid-friendly version of the adult uh, drag brunch that they, they typically host on a regular basis, uh, but modified for children. Um, the performers and their routines uh, were, weren't doing anything that was really any more risque than what you might see at a cheerleading competition um, or a gymnastics show. Um, the kids were playing musical chairs. Uh, they had the chance to sort of vogue and strike poses with the performers um, and there were mocktails. So, I mean, so this was, this was a different sort of event, but the event turned very ugly before it even began because dozens of really aggressive right-wing right -wing protesters uh, showed up to pick at the bar. Um, they were using megaphones to call attendees groomers, um, you know, obviously a word that we've been hearing a lot lately, um, using slurs like the F word, um, calling attendees disgusting or child abusers, um, often kind of labeling um, or targeting um, these labels at, at parents who are there with their children. Um, some of these protesters uh, tried or, or even succeeded in you know, either forcing or tricking their way inside the bar. Um, and some of them ended up following both the performers and families with kids back to their cars while shouting at them, heckling them. Uh, local activists, a number of whom were present to defend the bar against the protesters, took videos documenting the conflicts, um, as did some of the right-wing protesters, uh, as well as a local documentarian. So, you know, a lot of what I am drawing on is, is thanks to the footage that, that these folks have taken. Um, so hopefully we're going to be able to, to share some of those clips, um, which there are links for on the next slide. Um, a heads up, uh, as you might imagine, these, these clips are sometimes pretty vile. So we can go to the next slide. And uh, my fingers are crossed that um, we will I'm be I'm so to... sorry, my computer's not uh, cooperating, it's freezing. I'm trying to <laughs> make it work here. <laughs> Okay. okay. I mean, another somewhat cl clunkier option is I could share my screen and just play the videos. Yes. If you want to try that, I'm absolutely frozen right now. Sure I'm so sorry. No, no problem at all. Um, bear with me just one minute, please. Take your time. Um, I, I find the, the use of the word groomer particularly offensive. Um, I'm, I'm a former teacher. Uh, and have been involved in education for the past almost 15 years now. And, um, and I, I also, um, you know, I'm a survivor of uh, sexual abuse. And so to be called that is particularly uh, offensive and especially as someone who's devoted their life to caring for other kids. But we can talk about that more later. I was just kind of trying to fill the, the time while you get your um, yours all ready to go. Okay. Great. No, absolutely. It's. I think I have it back. <laughs> Shall I hit play? <laughs> Cross your fingers, everyone. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, boy, I'm so sorry. This is not working. That's okay. I, I think I can. I believe I can share my screen, and um, I think it should come up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for your patience. This is a really important conversation. There we go. Fantastic. Okay. Is this showing for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so here, here is uh, the first, um, I'm going to play four clips um, from this one. 
this, uh, this particular clip was actually taken by a right-wing activist, um, this guy, Taylor Hansen, who is sort of an activist, um, self-described journalist, um, kind of does these undercover stunts. He dressed up in drag himself to go inside this bar um, and take videos that he then shared around uh, right-wing media. Um, but this is one that he took outside of one of the leaders of this movement, a guy called John Doyle. Is there any way you can maybe turn it up too? Okay, that's that's one. I'll I'll just run through these um, uh, quickly. Uh, this this is one that was taken by a local uh, progressive organization, a mutual aid society, that was there um, to sort of counter protest. Um, and so they took a, a number of, of videos as well. Um, these ones, they're fairly short. The fist of Christ will come Jesus down will come on you very soon. Uh, the fist of Christ. Are you done with this? Is that your fist? Are you done with this? It's your fist. It's your fist. Uh, it's your fist. It's your fist. It's your fist. It's your fist. The fist of Christ will come Jesus down will come on you. Sorry, not trying to hear that twice. Um, okay, this is uh, John Doyle again. We'll we'll hear more about him in a minute. Okay, if, if, if you had any trouble hearing that, that was uh, John Doyle um, encouraging the, the police who were there to protect the event, to, to keep the protesters and counter protesters separate and calling on them to go inside the event and put bullets in all their heads. Um, they'd be rewarded for it. That's what the badge is for. Um, and here is the last that I'm gonna share right now. Um, so there, uh, I, we actually think that, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, we actually think that uh, this group misheard um, the protesters here. Um, we think they're actually saying it's going to be so keck when we take away all your rights, um, which is ridiculous, but is, is a piece of slang um, that is commonly used within the America First Griper movement, it basically means LOL. Um, so 
in essence saying it's going to be so hilarious when we take away every single one of your rights. In other footage from the protest, um, you can see a man pushing through these counter protesters in order to follow a family with two young kids back to their car, yelling things like, I'd be ashamed to be your child. Why are you hiding from the crowd? Um, another protester shouting through a megaphone that he was wearing gardening gloves so he didn't quote unquote get AIDS. Um, there was a local documentarian there, uh, Dallas filmmaker Kurtz Frozen. Um, and he did interviews with, with both uh, protesters, right-wing protesters and progressive counter protesters, um, you know, and, and kind of put this footage together. And in some of that footage, um, which I, I recommend, it's, it's really fascinating, but too long to play here. Um, one man says, we're just early to the party, mark my words. One day everyone will see what's going on in there and people will be pissed. Um, and at another point that uh, Frausen ended up documenting, um, and at least one point during this protest, the protesters started chanting, Christ is king, um, which is a phrase that has been sort of appropriated uh, as a rallying cry for this America first Groyper movement. Um, do we have, uh, is, is the, uh, just without video, is the, the PowerPoint working? Awesome, sweet. Um, so after the protest, uh, these sorts of videos, particularly the ones that were taken by the right wing protesters went viral, um, you know, but not just on the right, not just on the left, they went kind of viral on both sides. Um, on the right, they were amplified by a number of conservative politicians and also media outlets. We saw this phenomenon that often happens in uh, right wing and conservative media where the news story works its way up the food chain pretty quickly. Um, starting in sometimes pretty obscure, sometimes pretty noxious corners of the internet um, and going from there to like Alex Infowars or Glenn Beck's The Blaze or the MAGA website American Greatness uh, or Steve Bannon's War Room. All of these covered this story. Um, and then it makes its way up to somewhat more mainstream, um, larger platforms on the right, like the Daily Caller, and then of course, Fox News as well. Um, one right-wing podcast uh, run by a guy named Steven Crowder, who has a really large following. Um, one of his co-hosts uh, talked about this issue when they covered it by remarking that Nazism had arisen, quote, as a response to this kind of culture developing in Germany end quote. Um, so there's sort of an implicit warning um, or, or threat in there that this sort of culture is, is what gives rise or justifies Nazism. Um, and it, so it's sort of chilling that very similarly when Tucker Carlson covered it uh, a day or so later, he introduced footage of the protest and of this drag, so, drag show by saying, quote, just another weekend in Weimar. By Monday, state representatives in both Texas and Florida had vowed to introduce bills that would ban drag performances in the presence of minors. Um, in Texas, Representative Brian Slayton said that it wasn't enough for conservatives to make sure their own kids don't go to such shows, but that all kids have to be protected by from this sort of quote unquote sexualization. In Florida, um, a representative named Anthony Sabatini, uh, who is running for Congress, he is also a supporter of the QAnon conspiracy theory, uh, he went even further, um, vowing that he would propose a bill that would terminate the parental rights of any adult who brings a child to a drag performance. Language like this has led a lot of LGBTQ advocates to warn that that bills like that, um, you know, banning kids from, you know, attending a drag performance could easily be stretched to cover a lot of things that are not, you know, a, a drag brunch. Um, it, it could be used to ban things like Drag Queen Story Hour, which is just people in drag reading stories in libraries. Um, and that it could also arguably um, be expanded to prevent children from being in the presence of trans people at all. Um, as we've seen with the, the kind of explosion of groomer language on the right, uh, I don't think that it's really that far off to, to assume that it could be argued or interpreted in that way. Uh, soon after on the federal level, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene also said that she would introduce similar legislation 
Um, and then Green also went on to uh, dedicate one hour long episode of her live stream show. She does, uh, I think it's a Facebook live show, uh, dedicated one hour of that to clips of different pride performances all around the country that, that she thought were just terrible. Um, in another show, she hosted um, one of the Dallas protesters, one of these far right protesters on her show for a nearly hour long interview. And she also called trans rights a complete attack on God's creation. The protest obviously generated a lot of attention um, and these different calls for action on the right, but less attention was paid to who was behind it and how radical their connections were. A large number of the pro protesters there were affiliated with uh, or obviously inspired by extremist Gen Z expressions of far right activism. Uh, many of them were explicitly connected to the America First Groiper movement as well. And one example of that is John Doyle, um, the man you saw in the sort of natty getup um, in the clips above. Uh, he is an early 20s YouTube streamer. He's got an audience of some 300,000 subscribers and he's pretty closely aligned with the America First movement. Um, as a quick sidebar, um, I think we have an, the next slide here. Um, you might have heard of the, the America First movement before. Perfect, thank you. Um, this February, they hosted their annual conference, the third version of it, the America First Political Action Conference, um, which is framed sort of as this far right alternative to CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, which is already pretty far right. Um, they hosted this in Florida um, and, and it was pretty outrageous this year. Um, the movement's leader, Nick Fuentes, uh, who is an avowed racist. Um, he constantly is, is using the N-word. Um, you know, he is just very explicitly, constantly making arguments about uh, replacement theory, the racist conspiracy theory, that uh, there is an intentional effort to demographically replace um, white populations with non-white populations. Um, in the last couple of weeks, he even released a, a video of him saying he wants to return to medieval society where women can't uh, read or vote. Um, so he's just kind of a professional provocateur in some ways. And, and at the conference in February, um, he was full of praise for Vladimir Putin. He got this Putin chant going um, and he even praised Hitler. Um, so that's sort of the person that Nick Fuentes is. Um, but alongside him, uh, there were a number of politicians, um, including a couple from Arizona. Uh, Paul Gosar and uh, State Representative Wendy Rogers both uh, gave video presentations to the conference. Um, in Rogers' video, she called for building gallows to hang traitors, by which she basically meant her political enemies. Um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene appeared in person. Um, and when she was later confronted about this for appearing at such a far right forum, uh, she defended it by saying, um, you know, this is a group of people, of young people who are there to pro proclaim that Christ is King. So she is, um, knowingly or not, I would assume at least somewhat knowingly, she is reiterating, she's repeating um, that America first Groiper slogan. Um, and, and she said, you know, these are, these are young people um, who, who need to be reached and they're an important audience for me. And so I'm going to go and be there. Um, John Doyle, the, the protester there in Dallas uh, spoke there as well. Um, and John Doyle is one of the people who has used that sort of outright Christian fascist uh, language and self-identification. And I'm gonna share another couple of videos here. Bear with me, sorry for the technical. And they were just a little difficult to hear the last time, so I don't know. Um, Bump it up? Turn them, yeah, if you could turn it up a little bit, that would be great, thank you. Okay, so this, um, these two videos uh, were taken at the University of North Texas, um, which is in one of the suburbs north of Dallas. And uh, there last October, um, John Doyle and a number of people in, in his orbit 
hosted a, um, an anti-abortion protest on campus. Um, so this is them grappling with, with some of the students and counter protesters there. Well, this is the, uh... I am eradicalizing the youth. You can do nothing about it. You better be nice because if we take power. Okay. Um. Sorry, me. something is going on here, sorry. Um, while you're looking for that, uh, I was really struck by the number of young people, Gen Z people. Yeah, it's it's an extremely young, um, extremely online movement, um, which is mm -hmm. partly why there's so much documentation of the things they're doing. Um, right. This is another video clip from that same event. So just one more little snippet there. Okay, um, so that, as you probably heard, was him saying, um, John Doyle again saying, um, you, you all better be careful, um, better be nice, because when me and my friends take power, bad things are going to happen to you. Um, and so this is, this is the sort of an antagonism um, that has been, been going on at, at a lot of these events. Another leader at the protest um, at the Mr. Mr. Bar was a woman named Kelly Neidert, um, who is a recent graduate of the University of North Texas, that same school there, that is not a coincidence. Um, she led an awful lot of anti-trans events there, um, you know, to the point where her fellow students, uh, you know, were launching petitions for, you know, things like her to be kicked off school, not, not be allowed to graduate, things like that, which in turn then gained her celebrity on the right. Um, you know, she was able to kind of befriend Michelle Malkin, um, a kind of notorious far right leader um, who, who supported her because of that. Um, Nider is also founder of, of a group um, that doesn't seem to be very large. It might not really be much larger than herself called Protect Texas Kids, um, which was one of the official sponsors of this protest outside the Dallas bar um, and conducts an awful lot of other LGBT, anti-LGBTQ activism. Um, after the UNT protest that Doyle was at where he was saying what's wrong with Christian nationalism last October, uh, Nider also went on Twitter and described herself in this tweet that you can see here as a Christian fascist. So she says, yeah, I'm based a Christian fascist. Um, I guess that's supposed to be one of those initialism poems um, that doesn't quite work here. Uh, last month, Nider got permanently banned from Twitter after she tweeted, quote, let's start rounding up people who participate in pride events. Um, and the kicker there is that she tweeted that from the Texas Republican Convention in Houston, where she was an official um, presenter in their exhibit hall. She had an official booth to promote her group, Protect 
Texas kids. Um, so as, as fringy as these people seem, as clearly extreme as they are, um, it doesn't mean that they are completely shut out um, from, from halls of power, um, from more influential connections to more mainstream or, or at least more prominent um, state and national Republicans. At the same convention, um, you might remember, you might have seen this, uh, another protester who was at the Dallas Mr. Mr. event, um, a sort of stunt comedian named Alex Stein generated national attention uh, after he chased Representative Dan, Dan Crenshaw around the convention hotel, calling him Eye Patch McCain. Um, so basically calling him a rhino, uh, a Republican in name only. Um, just last week, Alex Stein got attention for himself again um, by sexually harassing uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, as she was uh, going around in Washington. There was another faction present at the Dallas event besides Joyle and, and the men that he represented and Kelly Neidert and her sort of young college crew of anti-LGBTQ activists. Um, and this was a new far-right Catholic group that calls itself the New Columbia Movement. Um, it's a small movement, but it's extreme enough to pay attention because they have linked up with these, these larger groups that have such a substantial online following of young people. Um, the New Columbia Movement openly advocates for a theocratic version of fascism. Um, you know, fascism very much, again, kind of using, using the language that they use for themselves or the references that they make. Um, they want America to be, quote, reborn as a model of Christian society. Uh, they argue that democracy and equality are failed experiments. Um, they envision that under their perfect society, governments might allow non-Christians to retain their personal culture, um, quote unquote, uh, but only could do so under a, quote, high American culture that's based on Christian morality. Um, its leaders in, in their many videos, they are also young and very online. Um, they trade in anti-Semitic memes and rhetoric. They have praised the, the violent incel movement or involuntary celibate movement, praising particularly leader, um, not leaders, but, but figures within that movement who have become mass killers. Uh, and they have openly supported past fascist regimes um, such as Mussolini's Italy or Franco's Spain. The protest in Dallas was just one of a number of far right attacks on pride events that we saw last June around the country. Um, there was, as you probably saw, also an incident in California where a group of proud boys stormed into a public library that was hosting a drag queen story hour. Um, one of the men was wearing a shirt that read, kill your local pedophile. Um, pretty famously in Idaho, there was a group of 31 members of the white nationalist hate group Patriot Front um, who were arrested out of the back of a U-Haul van. This is a picture of them after they've been arrested. Um, but they were carrying shields, metal poles, um, at least one smoke grenade, and they plan to use all of these to incite a riot at a pride celebration being hosted in a park there. The Anti-Defamation League also issued a report in mid-June noting that already by, by the midway point in the month, there had been numerous incidents like this, um, numerous threats of lethal violence around the country um, aimed at, at pride events and, and people organizing them. Um, this is a national issue, obviously, but Texas and particularly the Dallas area have become a hotbed for it. Um, it turned out that eight of those Patriot Front members who got arrested in Idaho were from Texas and, and seven of that eight were from the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, so after Ben and I wrote the piece that I've just been talking about, I ended up writing more about why Dallas, um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area has become such a hotspot for this activity, particularly the Northern and Western suburbs around it. Um, so just a few days after the protest at the bar in Dallas, uh, a number of the very same far right figures who had been harassing patrons there also showed up at a city council meeting uh, in the Dallas suburb of Frisco. Um, when the city was issuing its first ever recognition of Pride Month. Um, a number of people who came to that municipal meeting uh, showed up in face masks um, with a sort of creepy cartoon beaver logo on it. Um, these, these are, um, it's, it's the mascot of a local rest stop franchise um, and it's been adapted um, 
through no fault of, of the business, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it's been adopted as part of the unofficial uniform of, of the Proud Boys. And yeah, you can see it right there. The, the guy on, on the far right is wearing this mask. And so you could see a lot of these people in the city council meeting, some of them um, going up to speak wearing these masks. Um, you know, some of these people were, you know, saying violent things um, that, you know, they wanted to take parents uh, who had brought their children to this municipal event. So not even just, uh, you know, targeting people who had taken their kids to a family friendly drag show, but even parents who had taken their kids to, you know, a very dry city council meeting to officially recognize pride in, you know, very, you know, kind of bland official language. Um, that that was so inappropriate that those parents should be taken outside and beat up, beaten up. Um, and some of them also followed people who were celebrating the proclamation over to a local restaurant that was hosting a celebratory uh, reception and kind of just were there to intimidate them to the point that other uh, patrons of the restaurant became so uneasy that they called the police. Kelly Neidert was there um, at the city council meeting uh, as was a member of the New Columbia Movement who ended up starting a group chant of Christ the King, um, which again is this, um, you know, th this scriptural phrase that has been adapted and co-opted as a rallying cry for the America First movement. Um, so that again kind of shows the overlaps that are building between these communities. There have since been a number of other events in the area where NIDER and other anti-LGBTQ activists have appeared alongside the Proud Boys, um, have appeared to be using them as a form of ad hoc security. Uh, they did that just last week in, in Houston where she led another protest uh, against another restaurant in Houston. None of this, of course, is taking place in a vacuum. Um, advocates and observers of advocates for LGBTQ equality, I should say, and observers of the right and the far right, um, you know, make the very convincing argument that you can draw a straight line from that sort of street harassment that we're seeing and the rhetoric that you hear from Republican leaders like Ron DeSantis, for example, um, whose press secretary smeared anybody who supports LGBTQ equality uh, earlier this year as a groomer. Um, or the Texas Republican Party, which at its convention um, last month, um, the one from which Kelly Nider tweeted, we should start rounding up anybody who goes to pride events. Um, the official Texas Republican Party officially declared homosexuality an abnormal lifestyle choice. This is also an example of how the right wing has shifted though, part of its focus to local issues in hopes of building influence for the long-term um, as part of a kind of a long-term game plan that people like Steve Bannon have laid out explicitly that the Proud Boys have also, also spoken to explicitly, um, you know, to, to get involved at the local level and take over the Republican party from the ground up. So it's true on both the official level um, with efforts like things to take over school boards, and then also true kind of at the fringier extremist level as, as groups like the Proud Boys are trying to enact their own vision locally um, in, in the means that they use, which is typically you know, intimidation um, and either violence or the threat of violence. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about before we, we break for closing is that the growing alliance between the religious and radical or white nationalist far right isn't limited at all to anti-LGBTQ activism. Um, some of the same networks have also been teaming up to fight reproductive access as well. Um, and in, in May, um, ben Lorber and I again teamed up to, to document how far right Catholics and the America First groupers were collaborating uh, to fight abortion access in the aftermath of the leaked Supreme Court opinion that forecast the overturning of Roe v. Wade um, that has obviously now happened. Um, in the immediate aftermath of, of that leak, when there were protests around the country, um, one protest and sort of a counter protest or kind of conflict that occurred in New York City went viral. Um, there was a video of a confrontation um, that took place outside of a church where a man standing outside a Catholic church in downtown Manhattan um, ended up taunting pro-choice protesters in a particular way. And I think you've likely seen this as well, but I'll, I'll just share this one last video.
I'll take this opportunity too. If you do have any questions uh, for Catherine, then uh, you can put them in either the Facebook uh, post or you can put them, if you're here in the webinar, in the webinar chat. Okay. Okay. Um, so that that in in that video, um, the man speaking was labeled as FDNY Fire Department of New York because he was wearing a fleece um, that that had the FDNY logo on it. Um, New York's fire department very quickly came out and said that a guy is not one of our firefighters, um, but he was actually affiliated with one piece of clothing he was wearing which was his blue America First hat, um, which is the, the hat associated with the Groper movement. Um, and it turned out that this man um, was indeed a member of the movement. That night he called into a, a popular Groper live stream show to, to brag about going viral with his video. Nonetheless, despite the fact that he is part of this movement that has you know, been involved in, in extremely kind of vicious racism, misogyny, um, homophobia, Islamophobia, kind of everything that you can think of. Nonetheless, um, that man and the group of protesters he was with was praised by Republican politicians like Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and also by far-right Catholic organizations like Church Militant. Um, it's important to note here that Church Militant is very far from representative of mainstream Catholicism. Um, and in fact, most of its identity revolves around opposing mainstream Catholic Church, as well as the Pope, who they consider, even though this is not very accurate, um, they consider Pope Francis to be a radical progressive. Uh, last November, Church Militant hosted a, a really aggressive protest conference in Baltimore targeting the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is the official body of the Catholic hierarchy, because they had not yet actually gone ahead and banned Joe Biden from receiving communion. They had just talked about it and sort of threatened that they would. Um, and that then also showed this growing overlap between far right Catholicism and activist groups. Uh, the MC of the Baltimore protest rally convention sort of thing um, was Milo Yiannopoulos, a former star of the alt-right. Uh, and one of the speakers was Michelle Malkin, um, who has you know, definitely made a lot of ties with open white nationalist groups, has spoken at their conventions, and there in Baltimore used language that was just very visibly a reference to the Great Replacement Theory. Church Militant has also, as Ben and I reported, made much more direct connections with the America First movement. Uh, they have hosted its members on their programs. They have praised the movement as being dynamic and exciting. And one of the outlet staffers is even an outright member of the Groypers. Um, the two groups have also tried to plan joint anti-abortion protests um, back in May, uh, but most of those ended up being canceled. I think only one of them went ahead. And after Ben and I published the first part of our story, um, which got broken up in two for length, uh, Groyper leader Nick Fuentes, who I talked about before, uh, he responded to it on his live stream show that night saying, you're damn right, the Groypers are forming an alliance with the Catholics, and you're right, we have a plan, and we're going to take the Republican Party, and we are going to drag it against its will back through the doors of the church and to the altar, and we are going to baptize it. I think it's also important to note that many of the moderate and liberal members of the US Catholic Church are very aware of and concerned about the growing influence of these far-right groups and movements in their church. Um, so I'll just end on this. Um, one of these writers, uh, D.W. Lafferty, who writes for a group that sort of monitors the influence of the Catholic far-right, told me, quote, I worry whenever you see anti-abortion rhetoric mixed with anti-immigrant rhetoric or isolationist foreign policy. It feeds into the spreading panic that Western culture is disappearing and immigration is killing Christianity and white hegemony. Ordinary Catholics who may have good intentions need to wake up to this, the bishops included. Because if we look at what's happened in the Republican party, a fringe populist element eventually took over 
and we could see the same thing in the church. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thanks. No, thank you. Um, that was a disturbing deep dive on uh, what's going on with so many young white men, it seems. Um, we do have one comment in the Q&A that I'm just going to read. This comes from Dee. She says, it would appear that Catholic and evangelical should come out very strongly about these groups that have nothing to do with Jesus, though I'm pretty comfortable if they bring down these two religions. <laughs> so more of a comment than a question, really. Um, one of the, and again, if anybody has any questions, please, by all means, um, submit them in the chat. Um, one of the things that really bothered me that was said, I don't remember who said this, I think it may have been Doyle. Um, he talked about teachers as pedophiles because most normal people don't want to be around kids who aren't their own. And I'm seeing this as a former educator myself come up more and more frequently. And, you know, I taught in Title I schools. There have been several times that I've had to make calls to the uh, Department of Child Services because of abuse. You know, we are the first line of defense sometimes. We're the mandated reporters who recognize when a child is behaving differently in class or they exhibit behaviors that cause you concern, right? Um, we're the first ones in line if there is a, a school shooting. You know, our entire lives are dedicated to teaching and, and caring about and providing for and protecting our students. You know, in fact, Arizona just passed a law, uh, it was HB 2161, and that uh, bill was about not allowing, it, well, it started out basically to try to out kids who are LGBTQ, you know, to parents. If, if, a, if a teacher sees a child exhibiting behavior that it would indicate that they're a member of the LGBTQ community, they did kind of strike that out of the bill, but at the same time, they won't allow surveys of kids, which was how, you know, one of the ways that I would kind of find out what, what, what was going on with my students, you know, do you have a place in your house to do homework, because I had some students who there could be seven to 10 people living in a two bedroom apartment. And for me to have that information to know, like, if they're not going to be able to get their homework done at home, then I wanted to be able to provide a place and a time for them so that they could, you know, finish their homework, things like that, they see as, you know, somehow grooming. And so I, I don't know, that's really a comment, but I just wanted you to maybe talk about that, that a little bit, how these, how educators are being portrayed in some of these far right circles. Yeah, no, I think that that, that is really relevant. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a reporter who focuses on, on the right and often the religious right. Um, but because the way our politics have gone, you know, for the last few years, that's also meant um, becoming something more of an education reporter because so many of these fights, um, these culture wars are being expressed um, through the schools. And I think, yeah, I mean, that I started seeing this groomer language probably in February. And to me, I think that this shows, uh, you know, some of the ways in which all of these fights are connected and they need to be treated as connected um, because the, the first place that I personally saw the groomer language um, was in the Twitter feed of a um, person who has been one of the basically top two anti-critical race theory activists in the country. Um, somebody that Chris Rufo, uh, a name that you know some of you all might be familiar with, this guy who's credited with being the architect of the anti-CRT panic. The, this is the person that Chris Rufo credits as being basically the intellectual kind of founder of the movement against so-called critical race theory. Um, and he started in his Twitter feed, just kind of responding to any critics with, okay, groomer, okay, groomer, kind of, you know, a, a play on the, the okay boomer um, meme that, that came out several years ago. And then, you know, pretty quickly, we see it start to get picked up in many other places. Um, you know, when uh, the Walt Disney Corporation or Walt Disney Company, I think it is, um, came out against Florida's uh, kind of classroom censorship law um, that has been nicknamed the Don't, Don't Say Gay Law. Um, 
when when Walt Disney protested that and, and said this is you know this is bad for Florida and, and we are a huge interest in Florida, um, you know we saw obviously uh, just this crazy proliferation of you know merchandise that you know had the the Disney um, palace and and logo with kind of the the word Disney replaced with groomer, um, you know that language has been used you know widely including by people in government to refer to anybody who is speaking out for lgbt t equality um, and then it started being used in this even looser way still um, you know that that people um people have gone after something called social emotional learning um, which jean as an educator i'm sure you're very familiar with but you know, at its most basic, that's kind of just teaching kids how to manage their emotions, how to be nice to their classmates. Um, but they have become convinced that SEL, a social emotional learning, is kind of the conveyor belt to critical race theory. Um, and so they started accusing people, um, teachers who use SEL in the classroom, which most teachers do, um, speaking as the daughter of, you know, uh, and the sister of public school employees, um, you know, they started accusing them of, of kind of ideological grooming or even suicide grooming um, because part of some SEL programs uh, was sharing information about suicide hotlines. And so sharing that information was cast as grooming children into considering suicide. Uh, it's sort of mind blowing if this was not happening at, at such a, official levels. I mean, this same movement then inspired uh, Florida Governor um, Ron DeSantis to, to end up uh, his administration, that is to, to reject close to half of the math textbooks that were submitted for approval because they claimed that they contained woke math. And, you know, when people dug a little bit deeper, um, you know, it wasn't that there was no critical race theory in the math books any more than there is in the rest of public K-12 schools, um, but even less in these math, math textbooks. What there was was some SEL concepts embedded, you know, within the basic curricula, like, you know, tips for teachers, like maybe you guys should have a, you know, an introductory kind of discussion circle at the start of your school day. I mean, this is very benign stuff that is being cast as so, you know, so so dangerous um, and and as an example of grooming. So I think we just have to to see these things are connected. And I think um, to go back to Christopher Rufo, um, the person who has done so much to orchestrate this this anti CRT panic, um, and also to orchestrate kind of the the attack campaign against Disney um, for protesting. Ron DeSantis's anti-LGBTQ law, um, you know, he has made these arguments. He's somebody who is very, um, very upfront about his strategy, kind of says, this is what I'm going to do next. And so one of the things that he said in a speech that he gave, I think in April, um, was, you know, making this argument that in order for us to get to universal school choice, um, which is kind of right-wing euphemism for universal vouchers, um, a, a universal, you know, complete kind of parental school choice that would end up in practice basically defunding the public education system for everybody. Um, but he was making the argument that, you know, part of getting to that place of universal school choice would involve, it would have to come out of an atmosphere of universal distrust of, of public schools. Um, and so I think we have to think of all of these things as, as part of that larger atmosphere. Um, and in these ways, I think a lot of these things are connected. Yeah, agreed. And I mean, I'm, uh, I would argue too that they, this, this, these groups of people who say that they want to, the claim that they want to keep kids safer are actually um, you know, putting them at, at greater danger. You know, if children don't feel comfortable being able to talk about the things that are happening to themselves, um, or, or if teachers don't feel comfortable uh, hearing the stories that the children need to share with them, I, I would say that you're putting children in danger, you know, by denying, um, you know, comprehensive sex ed, which study after study shows that it, it, it 
gives children the vocabulary that they need to be able to identify uh, between good touch, bad touch, um, and, and to create boundaries and, and to know words like consent. And so by denying those things to all kids because of your you know, ideology just ends up putting more kids in danger. So, um, and I, I wanna honor your time because I really am so grateful that you were able to join us today. I see that Lindsay has put in the link for the article that you referenced along with your Twitter handle and for folks to be able to uh, get a hold of you. Um, I wanna point out too in the chat that we also have uh, some events coming up. Our uh, school board candidate forums continue. Um, and you spoke of the three percenters earlier. We actually had a, a candidate forum with the local school district here in Maricopa County. And one of the um, one of the candidates is a self-proclaimed, you know, card-carrying wow. member of the three percenters. And there's another one on that same board who's currently elected to office, whose husband has been identified as, I believe, either an oath keeper or proud boy, or I mean. They're, they're taking it to the school board level so that they can affect policy. And again, you, you referenced Wendy Rogers, we've got Paul Gosar here, Andy Biggs, folks whose names were brought up during the January 6th uh, insurrection hearings. I mean, Arizona has always kind of had that brand, um, but now they're, they're really taking it all the way to the heart of our democracy. So we do have Paradise Valley coming up Wednesday, July 27th, Wednesday, August 3rd, Kyrene School District is coming up. Um, and then this is an, uh, well, of course, we always share AZ end of life options. They have great programming. Uh, and then on Friday, August 12th, very exciting. We're going to have Hement Meta, who is the friendly atheist, and he's going to be talking about hate preachers. And if you are on Twitter, uh, you should follow um, if you're, if you're okay with being, uh, outraged every single thing that he posts, because he posts a lot of these so-called hate preachers. Who are politicking from the pulpit so great programming coming up great programming today thank you so much catherine for joining us Do you want to close us with anything at all no i i, I think i've said my piece but thank you so much um for having me and, and for being interested and and the Hemant's panel seems like uh that would be great he's he's fascinating well you're welcome to come join us says <laughs> and uh thanks everybody i have a wonderful friday have a great weekend and stay, stay cool out there because it's gonna be 115 degrees and stay safe. <laughs> yes, <laughs> see y'all later. All right.